When I first heard the phrase, needle in a haystack, I had no idea what that was. For I grew up in New York City, and we didn't know what a haystack was. And if you talk to kids today, they think it's a pile of food that you put up together with uh, beans and things like that. Is that true? How many of you have he heard of the haystack? Yeah, it becomes a very f popular Adventist thing, right? You want to feed somebody, don't have enough food, put a haystack together. And so when they say a needle in a haystack, what does that mean? Well, it simply has to do with uh, what we call today haystack. Now, I'm going to ask you to see if you can connect that uh, remote control. There we are. There's a haystack. Now, depending what country you're in determines how high a haystack is. In Poland, what they do is the ladies actually stand on a center pole and the men keep on pitching the hay on, on there and they walk around and walk around and walk around and walk around. And they go higher and higher and higher and higher. Depending on how high the pole is will determine how high the haystack is going to be. And many times it's way up there. Ladies find themselves up about second story, still walking on hay. So can you imagine finding a needle in that kind of a haystack? Uh, here's a picture of, the, of a needle in a haystack. And uh, there it is. So when they say finding a needle in a haystack, they actually are talking about something very difficult. Is that true? Something very con very difficult, challenging to the eyesight, because a needle oftentimes looks like a needle of a hay. And, uh, and so, finding a needle in a haystack, when I finally found out what it was, then I understood its meaning. There are many times in the scriptures that there are many things that we do not understand what they actually mean. And this morning, I'm going to do a f slight review because it's 10 to 12, and I know you usually stay here until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, correct? You're smiling. So let's pray together and open the Word of God. Heavenly Father, as we spend time in your Word, we ask for your blessing. After all, that's why we've come, to hear you speak to our hearts. And so bless we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is uh, Babylon Falling, or Babylon Has Fallen. As you know, there are many, many Christian denominations today. This is one website that has the amount of Christian denominations in the world. And uh, you can see that, uh, that there are quite a number of uh, denominations out there. This one says 39,000 different Christian denominations in about 4 million different worship sites. And it is just mind-boggling to realize that there could be that many different types of denominations from how many books? One book. And the reasons uh, are varied. But this morning, I'm just going to give you a, a little brief uh, outline because here's the problem. Almost all denominations claim to be the needle. What did I say? Almost all denominations claim to be the needle. And guess what? It's your challenge to find it in the haystack. Now, when you look at these numbers, there's a lot of hay in that stack. What do you say? And to find the right needle, the fact that all the claim to be the right one means that they recognize that there must be 
a right one. Now, some people get so discouraged with this that they finally say or come to this conclusion. All roads lead to Rome. How many of you have heard that before? Okay. And so uh, others will say, well, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you believe in one God. So there are different approaches to this, and some actually say it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. But I think it's important for us to recognize that if it did not matter, Christ would not have come to make it clear. Is that true? So it must matter. The challenge sometimes that we find is that if a person discovers the right one, they could become arrogant, uh, they could become proud, boastful, and somehow conclude that they're holier or better than everybody else. And that is bad. However, that does not take away from the reality that there must be a true line that Christ has given to us because we are told that through the truth, it will lead you through who? To Christ. You shall know the truth then, and it shall set you free. So, when you have so many different Christian denominations, this is not counting the other types of religions that are out there. And I'm speaking about the Muslim religion or the Jewish religion, or, of course, in India, uh, the Hindu religion, or in China and other places, the Buddhists. Uh, there are many, many different types of faiths out there. And so when you think of trying to find the right one, you can well understand how difficult it is and why it is that many people get discouraged and finally even get turned off and decide that if, if God's going to find them, God's going to have to look for them because they're not going to try to find a needle in a haystack. But there's good news. We can uh, begin with the Scriptures because when you're talking about faith, and I'm speaking about the Christian faith, uh, you can find it in the Scriptures. And the Christian faith does not start with the New Testament because the word Christian simply means somebody who's following Christ or who believes in Christ. Now, if, if a person happens to be an individual who has been trained and encouraged to believe that the New Testament is the only part of the Bible for the Christian, then you have no Christ before Christ. Which means then that everybody who was saved prior to Christ had to be saved some other way. And that's why some people conclude that in the Old Testament, people were saved by the law. In the New Testament, were saved by grace. And that's because before that, they recognized that there was Abraham and there was Noah and there were people who had a saving relationship with Christ, correct? Or they think with God, and therefore they have to somehow come up with some rationale how it is that people in the New Testament are saved by Christ and people in the Old Testament are saved without Christ and somehow they're saved. And so they have to come up with something called dispensations. What is it called? Dispensation. There are many rationales that people come up with. But the truth of the matter is that if you understand that Christ was from the beginning, then all who have been saved have been saved through Christ. That there's none who have been saved apart from Christ. And so we go way back in the beginning. And of course, in John 1, 1, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning. In what beginning? In the beginning of the world was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. So that's John 1, 2, and 3. John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. So we see then that the Word, or Jesus, because in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father. And we know that the only begotten of the Father, according to John 3.16, is who? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. 
So now we know that the begotten Son was actually where? In the beginning. So everyone who has been saved or shall be saved is never saved apart from Christ. All who shall be saved, who were saved, were only saved by Christ. The only difference is that before Jesus died, they were saved on the promise given in, in Genesis 3.15 that the seed would come and suffer. And that promise was fulfilled in Christ. And so everybody who was saved before the cross was saved based upon a promise by one who could not lie. And he gave his promise that in the future, the Messiah would come and die for them. And those who are saved now have to look back to the cross. So they have to look forward to the cross, and we look back to the cross. In each case, we're all looking in the same direction. Back to whom? To Jesus Christ. And so Jesus was in the beginning, Jesus was through the Bible, and Jesus ends the Bible. In, back, in fact, it does say, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's the last verse of the Bible. Did you know that? And so we find then that all are saved through Christ. Jude 1 verse 1. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. The what kind of salvation? The common. What does that mean? Does it mean cheap? Or does it mean community? Okay. Of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for what? For the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. All right, so there's a gospel. There's a what? A gospel that saves. And that's why Romans in 1 verse 16, and that's uh, Paul writing, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel then was a common salvation offered to mankind, and it was also offered to the people in Paul's day. And, he is, he, and Jews as well are reminding the believers that they ought to do what? Contend for the faith that was once delivered unto them. So in order for you and for me to know our true roots, we must go where? We must go here to the scriptures. In the beginning, there was how many faiths? It was one faith. It was Christ who promised his blood through a promised seed in Genesis 3.15. And so all who were human in those days accepted the one faith that was delivered to them through the Savior. And that through that faith, they would find salvation. And so the sacrifice began to be offered as a, uh, a memorial of that which would come to pass and which had already uh, taken place in the mind of God because we recognize that the cross was only an emblem of the pain that sin has brought to the heart of God from its very inception. And so right from the beginning, we find one faith. But it was not long before the enemy succeeded in dividing that faith into how many? Into two. So now you had Cain and Abel. And uh, when you get all the way to Genesis chapter 6, you find then that there are two groups of people. Those people are called the sons of God or the daughters of man. The sons of God are the descendants of Seth. The daughters of men are the descendants of Cain. And so you have two distinct groups of people who are following two separate tracks. But God only established how many tracks? One. Now you have two. And the sad thing about the, the two is that while they may appear alike, the reality is that only one brought salvation. And we know that's the case because when God instructed Noah to build the ark, there was only how many arks for salvation? There's only one ark for salvation. You could build all the boats you wanted to. You could say, I could believe anything I want to. But the truth of the matter was that only through that ark was there salvation. Is that true? And those who entered into that boat were saved. 
Those who did not enter into that boat were not saved. Question, who is the one that determines how a person is saved then? The human being or the one who offered salvation? It is God. So we can determine how we want to be saved, and that's what Cain did. But that type of salvation does not end up saving. It is only the salvation offered through the blood of Christ that saves. And so through this whole tension between those who believed differently than what uh, the, the Sethites believed, ended up losing their salvation, while those who followed, like Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, and then, of course, the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, found salvation. So we see a track. But there are how many tracks now? Two tracks. Right after that, God had to maintain those who would keep extending that track along the way. And while they extended that track and kept on building that track all the way up to the cross, there were others who were building a different track. Uh, for example, we have here the names of Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, Shem, in unbroken line, have preserved from age to age the precious revealings of God's will. And you can look at Luke chapter 3, which gives you a whole list of all the sons and sons and sons and sons until it finally goes all the way back to who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. God has put these genealogies in there to help us recognize that God has not lost track of his actual plan that he devised for man's salvation. Okay? So there are two elements that are very important in that track that God established. And those two elements are called faith or trust, and the other one, what? Obedience. You will find that all those who are considered to be true followers of God always had those two distinctions among them. Number one, they had complete trust in God. Number two, they obeyed God. Okay? Trust and obey. Isn't there a song like that? What's the words? Trust and obey, for there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Okay? Those two are identifying elements or distinctions that separate those who are true followers and keepers, as it were, the flames, uh, in the contrast to the many who had a form or a type or some semblance of the true track, but there was always some difference between them. And uh, God is the one who established that. Notice it says, but because Abraham obeyed my what? My voice and did what? Kept my charge. What else? My commandments, my statutes, and my laws. But Abraham was not only a man who obeyed God, he was a man of great trust in God. Is that true? So Abraham had faith. He said, by faith, Abraham, when he called, was called to go out into a place which he, after should receive an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. So he trusted, and what else? And obeyed. And friends, there is no, um, how can I say, shades of gray in this matter. The, the truth is that God has put out specific distinctions or conditions that separate between the true and the untrue or the false. It's interesting, recently, I was tempted to preach this other sermon to you, but I'll give you just a snip, snippings of it. Recently, uh, scientists had said that there were two conditions necessary. How many? Two conditions necessary for a planet to be able to sustain life. And that was that it had to be a, a ball the size of planet Earth, and it had to be near a sun the size of our sun in the same nearness. Only those two conditions, and there could be uh, life on another planet. However, since Carl Sagan made that statement back in the 60s, they have discovered over 200 different conditions. How many? 200. Which means then that there's the zilch. You know what that word means? Hmm? There's zilch. Uh, that's an old New Yorker term that we used to use. It probably, yeah, it means zero. 
There's zero, 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 zero possibilities of any planet out there to sustain life because it has to meet 200 conditions that have to be together at the same time in a millionth of a second. Did you hear that? Okay. So we know that there are conditions out there for different things. God also has his conditions for who is a true uh, faith and which one is not a true faith. Now I'm using the word faith in two ways. Okay. Faith as trust and also faith as in a system of belief. So God then makes plain that he has his truth carriers or those who he identifies as his own. Uh, he claims that Abraham is a friend. He claims David is his friend. Uh, he claims, of course, many throughout the Old Testament. You have uh, called Samuel and uh, you have people like Isaiah and people like uh, Elijah and Elisha, etc. So you have people who identify clearly as those who trust in God completely and have a genuine obedience to what God has given to his children to follow. Those two conditions are very important. Now, so from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, we find a clear tracing throughout the Old Testament of that truth which was savable, and those who accepted those, that truth found a relationship with their God. Those who did not, did not have a relationship with God. They had a relationship with other gods. And in those days, there were many, many different forms of gods that had been uh, developed and established. And then finally, from Adam all the way through Moses and up to Christ, you can trace it through the Old Testament. The people who walked in harmony with God's ways and the people who did not walk in harmony with God's ways. Now, it is clear, however, that God identified a certain group of people who he claimed to be his children. Is that true? And what were they called? We call them Israelites. Today we call them what? Jews. All right? By the way, the word Jew comes from Judah. There were these were people who lived in Judah and were called Jews. But prior to that, they were called Israelites because they were descendants of a man named Jacob whose name was turned to Israel. So if you were a descendant of Jacob, you were called an Israelite. And as I said, later on, they changed their name to Jew because Israel was completely destroyed and the remnants of Israel are scattered around the world of who some of you are sitting right here and don't know it. Do you hear what I said? Some of you are Jews and don't know that you're Jews. Did you know that? All right. So, who knows where you all are from, right? So now you have Jews, but God is tracing it all the way up to the Messiah because the Messiah had to come through the line of Judah. Through whom? And if you came through the line of Judah, you had to be a Jew. Now, people could say, well, that's arrogant. You mean God only chose a Jew to save the world? Well, it doesn't matter what you call it. What's important is what God has established. And if God established it that way, the quickest way and safest way to salvation is to say, yes, Father. If that's the way you've decided, I'm going to follow it. What do you say? You can sit and argue with it, or you can then get confused. Or you can sit and accept it and get out of confusion. And so God established it, and so that's why we believe that Christ is the promised Messiah. And there are 333 prophecies that establish that Christ fulfilled those prophecies, making him the true Messiah. So we place our faith in Christ. This faith then, Christ passed on to the apostles. So he taught the disciples the genuine faith because by the time that Jesus came, even the genuine faith was so mixed up with all sorts of ideas that Jesus had to separate the truth from the false. And he did so by his life, number one, and number two, by his teachings. His teachings then segregated between what was wrong and what was right. And because Jesus did that, sometimes people get it confused and think that Jesus is supporting something when reality is not. For example, a prime example is that famous uh, parable 
of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus speak about a fellow going to heaven and a fellow going to a burning place. Do you remember that? All right? Jesus is simply using what the Jews had accepted from Greek mythology. And Jesus was telling them that you have accepted an error. Because when the fellow said, well, I got five brothers, let them, let Lazarus go down to my five brothers and they'll believe. And the response was, nay, they have Moses and the prophets. If they will not hear them, they will not believe even if one were to rise from the dead. So what is Jesus teaching the Jews? You have taken a misconception. You have to get back to what? To the Bible. And the teaching of the Bible does not support somebody in heaven looking down at somebody burning some, somewhere down in some uh, hot place that's so hot that one drop of water can cool you off. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Jesus had to do what? He had to separate all of this mesh that was going on in order to bring to us what we consider to be the pure gospel. And that gospel then he gave to his followers, and his followers then began to teach that gospel to the world. However, it wasn't long before uh, things would happen. But in order to make sure where to find the truth, the writers of the gospel wrote certain counsels. Here's one. But if I tarry along, that thou mayest know how men ought to behave themselves in the house of God, which is the what? The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So now Christ had established a church, and this church was supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. Question, is there a truth then? Yes or no? There must be. The question is, which is it? <laughs> okay. It is plain that there's a truth. It's, it's, if you believe in Christ, then you must believe there's a truth. And I'm not saying that you must believe because I'm saying that. I'm saying that the natural conclusion, the natural uh, uh, result of believing in Christ is to believe what he taught. And he taught that there was a truth. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And when he told Pilate the truth, Pilate said, what is truth? So was Pilate a confused man? He was. Christ, however, was not confused. He made it plain that there was a truth. Now, skipping quickly, as the disciples were dying off and they left the church together to proclaim the gospel, there was fear that, again, there would be an amalgamation of the truth with other teachings. And so Paul wrote, For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. There was sorrow in, in that letter because all that Paul did to establish people in the truth, he feared they would be affected by others who had a semblance of truth. In fact, Paul himself said that there's somebody that comes and preaches to you another Jesus. So he recognized that there would be others. And Christ himself warned, didn't he? That there would be false, what? False Christ and false prophets. So we recognize then that if there's a false, there must be a true. Now, following the line of thinking that I'm trying to establish, we finally get to that truth that was established in the apostolic church. And uh, if somebody can press my computer, there it is. What would happen to that genuine faith? And so then we go to Revelation. Because after all the, the epistles, we come to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to quickly 
just remind you that in Revelation chapter 12, there's a woman dressed in what? In white. The white symbolizes what? Purity. The crown of 12 stars represent the apostolic uh, messengers because the word star in Revelation is, means angel or messenger. So the 12 messengers of the Christian church standing upon the moon, which symbolizes standing upon the Old Testament, which was made up of shadows and moons. So you have the, the apostolic church with the 12 messengers dressed in, the, in the white, symbolizing purity. And, of course, it says uh, with the glow of the sun. So the apostolic faith that was established by Christ himself is represented by a woman or a church. And that church it was considered to be the church of God. However, that church of God then would begin uh, and it would go for a period of time. And the period of time would be how long? 1260 days or years. And you know, in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. So the Bible reveals then that the, that the, the true faith, true system of belief that Christ had given would actually go into hiding for 1260 years. It didn't mean that it got demolished or obliterated. It just simply went into hiding. If it's hiding, it still means that it is in existence. It just means that it is what? In hiding. And during this time, we know that for 1260 years, there's another power that ruled the European nations uh, under the name of Christ. But you know that from history that the Roman church then, while it ruled the world, there was an others who were following what we understand to be biblical truths. Those people suffered persecution for 1260 years. But that period of time ended in 1798. Now, for some of us, especially for those of you that are young, like Carly, uh, you may think that 1798 is a long time ago, right? You may think your grandpa sitting next to you is an old man, right? Yeah, she's shaking her head too. The reality is, <laughs> the reality, okay, you got two against you, sir. All right. The reality is that 1798 is only about 200, 200 plus years ago. Is that true? So the persecuted faith then would finally uh, come out of hiding after 1798. And it, it, what's amazing is this, that, that in uh, Europe, when all the persecution was taking place and the Puritans and pilgrims left Europe, they left Europe so that they could follow their conscience in their belief system. And they left it with the intent of following the Bible. Following what? The Bible. And so they fled Europe from religious persecution. And so they wanted to get away from a king and from a pope. In both cases, they were being persecuted. They came here, praise God for America. What do you say? We are not subject to a pope or to a king. We could believe as we may choose. Now, I'm not going to get political with you here, so forget Trump for right now, okay? What did I say? Forget who? Now, that's like telling you to forget the right faced monkey, right? All right. So, here you have a situation where, just like in Noah's day, how much time did God give those people to repent? A hundred and how much? And 20 years. How much time have we had since 1798? Almost 200 years, 200 plus years, correct? So, the question is this then. Is there still a true faith today? There must be. Because the, the whole controversy in the scriptures is so between truth and falsehood. Correct? Is that true? Yes or no? Yeah. What is true and what is false? Because that which is true will save you. That which is false is a placebo, which may appear like it has saving power, but in the final, final analysis, it doesn't help you at all. And so, without feeling like you're being arrogant, the reality is 
that if God has a truth, then you must find it because it is the truth that will save you. And if there is a savable truth, then you will be blessed by discovering it, but not just discovering it, because the scripture says it is not they that only hear, but those that do the word, not the hearer, but the doer. So if I find what is truth, what is my privilege? To follow it. Because it will not bless you unless it becomes part of you. God did not give intellectual information. God gave information so it could become a transformation in your heart and life. The purpose of the truth is to make you a son and daughter of God. The purpose of the truth is to make you a better person. You should be holier than others if you know the truth. That should not make you feel like you're better than others, but it should make you a better person. What do you say? So you should be more honest than the other person. Is that true? Your language should be cleaner than the other person. Is that true? Your lifestyle should be cleaner than the other person. It doesn't mean that it is something you take as a credit on you, upon yourself, but rather you establish that way because God has put it in your heart to live in a way that you will become a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. That's why he said you shall know the truth and that truth shall make you free. So, in conclusion, finally, the Bible says that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with a remnant of her what? A seed. So, if there's a remnant, it means that after 1798, there are people who are considered to be remnant of the genuine truth that God had established from the time of the beginning that had been passed on from generation to generation. And so there must be today a truth that we can take hold of that makes us the seed or the remnant that remain. And that remnant then has to have two things. What are those two things? The commandments of God, what else? The faith of Jesus. There you have it. The same that Abraham ha had. The same that Noah had. The same that Jesus had. The same that Paul had. A genuine trust in God and a willingness to obey his commandments. And I'm just going to read to you a statement here. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form what? An unlawful alliance with the world. The message of Revelation 14 announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to what? Religious bodies that were once pure and have become corrupt. Since this message follows a warning of the judgment, which was in 1844, it must be given in the last days. Therefore, it cannot refer to the Roman church alone, for that church has been in a fallen condition for many centuries in other words there's no question from prophecy that there would be a divergent or many different uh, forms of christianity but among all of those there's one that is true the challenge is how to know the difference and i'm glad it makes it simple enough to establish this, there's how many lords? Only one true Lord, only one true faith, and only one true baptism. Now, I've thrown out the needle.
and there's a big haystack out there. So how to know the difference? Just I'm glad that God makes it simple. Here it is. And it cannot be something that you just think intellectually. It has to be a living experience. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Okay? And Jesus said that ultimately there will be how many folds? And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall become one fold and one shepherd. So ultimately, God purposes to bring the human race back to its original intent. God's intent was that all of us be of how many faiths? One faith. So God is going to return us back to that one faith. And in the world, there will be no question the genuine faith in the midst of all the other divergent faiths. It's up to the individual then to find the right one. Now you may say, why does God make it so difficult? It's not. It's simple. All you have to do is just simply read what the Bible says. Commandments of God. If I want to know which church is in harmony with God's will, all I have to do is just take the commandments and compare the church to the commandments. Does that church teach in harmony with the commandments? If it does not, in one point, the Bible says, if you break one, you break how many? You break them all. So in order for me to be certain that I'm following the right path, I must accept that path which encourages the keeping of all the commandments, number one. And number two, the faith of Jesus. Not the faith in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. Okay, how do you know what the faith of Jesus is? You go back to the, the Bible. It all leads us back to where? To the Bible. Praise the Lord, what do you say? It's not up to me then. It's not up to somebody standing up and telling you this is the way. It is up to you turning back to the Scriptures, finding out which way that is, and then getting on the track and following it. In that way, if you get on the right track, you will be predestined. Did you hear what I said? If you get on the right track, you will be predestined to end up where that track ends up at. And Jesus said, narrow is the way, straight is the way that leads to where? To salvation. How many of you today want to get on that narrow path? Any of you? I want to also, friends. I don't want to be lost. Listen, there's too much at stake to lose. And there's so much to gain. But we must recognize our responsibility. Here's the haystack. Are you having problems finding a needle in the haystack? It was a lady who was attending one of my meetings in, in Guam. And uh, that was a few weeks ago, by the way. Dennis and, uh, and Masik were with me. And we were having a tent meeting right next to the clinic. And one night I noticed this lady sitting out, outside of the tent. She wasn't going inside. She was sitting outside of the tent. And she would sit on the, fl on the ground with her back against one of the palm trees. And she would listen. She hadn't been invited. She happened to be a lady walking by. And so the next night she came by. She did the same thing. Sat outside and listened. Next night she did the same thing. So I finally went to get acquainted with her and talk with her. And I said, you know, you don't have to sit out here on the, on the ground. No, no, it's okay. No, no, it, 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 you, it's more comfortable inside. The, you can sit inside. You, it's okay. Oh, okay, thank you. So she began to sit inside. So Friday then, I made an announcement that we were going to have a baptismal service on Sabbath. No, pardon me, this was Wednesday. We are going to have a baptism on Sabbath. And uh, she came to me after the meeting. She said, uh, uh, I want to get baptized. Well, that was a surprise to me. Didn't know who she was, where she came from. 
um, but finally I found out she was Hungarian. And she, from Hungary, she moved to New York City. From New York City, she moved to Guam. You know, from a mega metropolitan area to a little small 156,000 population. So I asked her then, can I meet with you on Thursday? She said, sure. Well, she didn't show up on Thursday. So Friday, she was supposed to meet with me. She didn't show up on Friday. Saturday, Friday night, she comes back to the meeting. She's all excited. She's going to get baptized. And I'm thinking, how am I going to tell this lady that I can't baptize her yet? I need to find out if she, what she knows, what she understands, etc. So didn't have time at night. So Sabbath morning, then she came to the meetings. And uh, right after that, it was fellowship dinner. At the fellowship dinner, I sat down with her. And then she gave me all the information about being from Hungary, New York City, etc. And uh, finally, uh, moving over there to Guam. So I asked her, why do you want to get baptized? She said, uh, you know, I was walking by, and somehow I was impressed that I needed to, to find out what this was all about. And she said, I sat down and began to listen. And she said it resonated with a longing that I've had inside for a long time. I want to know what is truth, and I want to follow it. And she said, I'm so glad that you're preaching straight from the Bible and that what I'm hearing, I believe to be the truth of God. And I want to follow it. So she said, I want to get baptized this afternoon. So I said, so tell me, what do you do for a living? She said, I'm a stripper. Gulp. I said, you're a what? She said, I'm a stripper. So I said, is that why you didn't come last night? She said, yeah, I was stripping last night. As I sat there and listened to this woman talk about her spiritual quest, it was no question in my mind that this was one of the lost children that Jesus would have come for to bring to salvation. Do you understand? So I... I uh, sat there listening to her and thinking of two women in the Bible, one Mary Magdalene and the other one, of course, a woman at the well, who Jesus said, go and get your husband. I have no husband. Yes, you have. You're right. The one you're living with is not your husband and the other five. And then she said, I perceive you're a prophet. There are people who deep in their hearts and souls want to know what is truth? And when they hear it, it resonates with the longings of their hearts. Now, I have to tell you that I did not baptize the stripper. I uh, explained to her, I said, you know, if I were to baptize you right now, what would you be doing tonight? She said, I would, I would be stripping. She says, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. She said, I'm doing it because I need to make money. And then she said, when I go there and I see all these people coming to see me strip, I feel sorry for them. These people have nowhere to go. And here I am doing this just so I can survive. She said, I, you know. she said every time I do it, I ask God, God, please forgive me that I have to do this. And I said to her, no, you don't have to do this. God has a better way for you. God has a better purpose for you. Just follow the truth that God has placed in your heart. And God will provide a better way. She's waiting for me to return back to Guam so I can baptize her. But friends, God has made it plain that there's one truth. And that we must be loyal and faithful to that truth if we have it. If we don't, then God wants us to find it. And once we find it, we need to follow it. All of us need to follow it. Because while it is true that many people feel like my church is just as good as yours, truth is not about church. Truth is about God. 
And God is the one who has the truth. And when we find the truth, then it will set us free. How many of you want to be free? The only way to do that is to find and follow the truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize that there are many people like this woman. Yea, in many other churches, there are people who love you, who's just simply grown up with the way they've been taught. But deep in their hearts, they long for something better. And we know that your truth is in your word. And Lord, we pray that you'll help us to be lights to others. But help us to be faithful and true to that which we know. And grant it, Lord, that we will not entertain anything else that may appear to be when we know that it is not. Help us to follow the truth as it is in Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen.